the <clears throat> presence of everyone for this uh, study of Galatians that we'll continue. Almost from where we left off last time, <clears throat> I was re, uh, reminded by Nancy that when I was going over the uh, fruit of the spirit, <laughs> I only gave a partial list. So having been uh, properly uh, reprimanded, I will remand back to those that list and uh, uh, go over the ones that I left out. <clears throat> Before we do that, though, let's uh, have a short word of prayer. Bow with me, please. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this time of study. We're thankful for the scripture that has been given to us, for the profitability that we have through it, for the instruction and the uh, correction that we have. We pray, Father, that we may be students of these scriptures, that we may know thy will for us in this life, that we may gain the life to come. Thank thee for Jesus, for the fact that he died and was resurrected and now reigns with thee in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> so the uh, <clears throat> fruit of the Spirit and the reason that it's just called singular, whereas the works of the flesh are plural. But all these things constitute the one singular fruit of the Spirit. If you uh, one is missing one of these, then it's not the fruit of the Spirit. And, <clears throat> and the ones I left out were uh, peace. So we have start with peace and then the others that I left out. So the Greek word irene, uh, which is translated peace, it corresponds to the Hebrew word shalom. And that expresses the uh, idea of peace or well-being. It, it could either be physical or spiritual well-being or a, a restoration, a reconciliation with God. And uh, salvation in the full sense. <clears throat> in this sense, it is like uh, the peace that uh, talked about in Romans, the fifth chapter, verse one. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The other one is long suffering or patience. Uh, that's a, an active endurance of opposition. It's a, it's a steadfastness. It's a long suffering, of course. It's a uh, forbearance, but it's not a passive resignation. It's not a shallow good nature. Rather, it uh, enables one to uh, control his temper, it allows one to endure injury without taking vengeance. It's one of the virtues that Paul commends in Colossians 3 verse 12 it says there, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long suffering. It is God's nature to be long suffering. So should we. In 2 Peter, the third chapter, verse 9, it said, says there, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. <clears throat> Another fruit of the Spirit is kindness or gentleness, as the King James Version renders it. And this uh, word is only used by Paul. None of the other writers use it. Although uh, both the love of humankind, uh, Acts 28, verse 2, and brotherly love, 2 Peter 1, verse 7, are translated as kindness in the New Testament. The Greek word bearing the uh, uh, richest connotation has a basic meaning of usefulness, benevolence, and is translated as goodness, gentleness, 
in kindness. Once again, actions are emphasized, especially God's gracious actions, actions towards sinners. Titus 3, verse 4, and Romans 11, 22. The kindness God has shown us through Christ is equivalent to his grace and embodies the fullness of salvation, Ephesians 2, verse 7. When kindness is included in lists of human virtues, it can be understood as helpfulness to others, prompted by the experience of God's redemptive love, 2 Corinthians 6, verse 6, and Galatians 5, 22, and Colossians 3 to 12, which we just read. In that uh, great love chapter in 1 Corinthians, we read in chapter 13, verse, uh, verse 4, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy, love does not rate itself, it's not puffed up. <clears throat> None of the virtues or uh, fruits is uh, goodness. Now that's could be considered the practical manifestation of kindness, the kindly activity for the true good of others. In Galatians 6.10, for example, therefore, as we have the opportunity, let us do good to all, especially those of the household of faith. And it may at times include the sterner qualities of doing good uh, to others, you know, how Jesus drove out the money changers, or well, he was being good. In Romans 15, chapter verse 14, it says, There now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you are that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able to admonish one another. So they were good and able to admonish. The uh, last uh, fruit of the spirit that I left out was faithfulness, or as the King James Version says, faith. In the uh, King James Version, the Greek word uh, pistis is never translated faithfulness. It's always tra translated faith. It's a conviction of uh, religious truth, uh, the gospel. And in it, it's uh, credibility. It's a constancy in the profession of the system of such religious truth. Again, the gospel. Such conviction and profession, uh, profession is not the outcome of imagination, but is based on fact. So that's the last one. So we'll go back to where I left off. Last time, get down to it here, in verse 26 of chapter 5. It says there, let us not become conceited, and the King James uh, has desires of vainglory. In the ASV, just has vainglorious. And uh, it said, provoking one another, envying one another. And Philippians, the second chapter, verse three, it says there, let us let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in loneliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. So conceit uh, denotes a person who is void of real worth or self-worth, if you want to call it that. But it's one who wants to be admired uh, by others. <clears throat> it's uh, one who is proud when there is no reason or justification to be proud. There's nothing of which to be proud. Yeah, we we have a saying uh, in, in the country, and I, David probably know this, you know, it's, it's kind of like one, we say he, he has a saddle or a hat, but he doesn't have a horse. So he's all braggadocious, but, it, there's no basis for it. In the sixth chapter, <clears throat> uh, he says, brethren, 
uh, if a man, that a man who is not called a brother, is overtaken in a, in a trespass. He could have said, brethren, if a brother is overtaken, but he doesn't say that. He says, if a man is overtaken in a trespass, you, and that's a Greek plural, you who are spiritual, that's one in whom the uh, spirit rules, you restore, and to restore, you gotta have been there in the first place. So it's just to put in order to restore something to its former condition. So something had to first exist and be lost before it could be restored. It's, about, it's kind of like the church being restored. Well, if the church didn't exist first, then falling away, it couldn't be restored. See, to restore such a one, uh, that's a Greek singular. You is Greek plural, but uh, such a one is Greek singular. Uh, you store such one in a spirit of gentleness or meekness in the King James Version. And of course, we just uh, went over that. Considering yourself, that's the, the Greek singular. Lest you, that's also the Greek singular, also be tempted. <clears throat> and we'll uh, talk about that in just a moment. <clears throat> So uh, it says it is overtaken, is it overtaken in any trespass. Now the Greek could read even if, or if even. It's not clear which one of those is correct. So one of uh, two interpretations is uh, possible. It could be that the fault catches the individual by surprise suddenly without notice that he is before he is aware of what has happened. The exhortation to restore a person in such condition might be necessitated by the possible reluctance of spiritual leaders to do so. You know, they, you know, they could be annoyed by their irresponsibility of the offender and believing that he should have known better or taken greater care. And maybe that's true. Or another deal, it could be a, what's called a concessive clause or conceding, even if seems to introduce an exceptional case, implying a, a scandalous or flagrant sin. Uh, modern day concessive clauses uh, may begin with although. It would read, in that case, although someone is caught in the act of a particular sin, the exhortation to restore the offender would then arise from the possible outrage which spiritual leaders might feel towards such a person because he was so brazen as to sin openly. Of these two interpretations, it uh, seems that you know, to surprise would, would seem a better deal. Uh, it's not that someone is a habitual but somebody that just, you know, really caught on the The point is that Paul has in view a fault into which uh, the brother is betrayed or strays into unawares. So that uh, although wrong, it is not an intentional wrong. In this case, the brotherly help is demanded rather than unloving judgment. You know, if someone habitually sins and they know they're doing it, it's uh, pretty difficult to restore such a one there where they want to be. But somebody that just occasionally and just inadvertently sins, it's uh, not such a difficult thing to restore them. In verse uh, <clears throat> two, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now, this is a duty beyond uh, verse one, but uh, with the idea of verse one in mind. Concerning the man who had his father's wife, uh, they would read about in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter five, 
Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, verse 6 through 8, that this punishment, which was inflicted by the majority, is sufficient for such a man, so that on the contrary, you ought to rather to forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. He says, therefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. So the burden of this of his sin was almost too much for him to endure. So his brethren bore the burden for him. In verse three, for if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Now we all recognize that uh, it's a it's a difficult thing to uh, recognize and to consider one's own faults. It's hard to to just even recognize it. <clears throat> we uh, readily see faults in others while uh, assuming we have none, you know, the mote in the eye type deal. From such, we uh, develop a false conception of superiority. As Paul wrote in Romans the 12th chapter verse three, says to not think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. And he wrote uh, beforehand in 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, verse 12, we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. So a person uh, deceives himself when he thinks he is somebody when he's really, a, he's really just a nobody. Uh, the Greek word translated deceive is only found here. It carries the idea uh, of one who is a, uh, a mind misleader or, or one who deceives his own mind. His mind may uh, be able to ascertain the true meaning of something, but he, he's deceiving himself. But he's deceiving no one but himself. You know, we sometimes say he can't see the forest for the trees. <clears throat> In Galatians, the uh, sixth chapter, verse four, says, but let each one examine, uh, the word in King James and ASV is prove, let each one examine his own work, that is, his own attainments. Then he will have rejoicing in himself alone. And that alone is the Greek word manos. And not in another. <clears throat> and of course, this verse uh, supports and elaborates on the previous verse. In uh, Romans, the 12th chapter, verse 2 says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And in 2 uh, Corinthians 13, verse 5 says, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith test or King James would say, prove, test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus is in you, unless indeed you are disqualified? It's the same concept as, as the uh, examination here. And also in, in uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.21, test all things, or prove all things. Same, same word, same Greek word. So, one must uh, scrutinize his own work in light of the uh, objective truth of the gospel. Now, if that's honestly done, then he can be pleased with himself, that he, see, he can rejoice in himself, and he will not resort to disparaging others to make himself look, look good. Of course, when somebody does that, they, they uh, in reality, they, they just make themselves look good only to themselves. <clears throat> 
in verse five, it says, for each one shall bear his own load. And again, it says burden in King James Version and the ASV. Acts uh, 27, chapter verse 10 says, men, I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster and much loss, not only of the, the cargo or lading and ship, but also our lives. That's the, you know, the load or um, uh, verse five, or cargo in King James ASB. And that's a commercial term. And uh, it's the same word that's used in this Acts 27, verse 10. It means uh, cargo. Of course, when you when you laid something on a ship, you're loading cargo on, on a ship. So that's the, the burden is uh, of one's own responsibilities and failures. You know, you know, there's some critics that contend that a contradiction, a contradiction exists in Galatians. It's, the, the sixth chapter here between these two verses, between Paul's injunction that we should bear one another's burdens in uh, verse two, and then his assertion here that everyone shall bear his own burden. Uh, however, the uh, conflict is only apparent, it's not a real conflict. In the verse two, the word burden is battles. It's a burden or difficulty, something that's difficult. And in uh, verse five, the word for burden is fortion. It, it, it's a responsibility. In the first case, Christians are being enjoined to help each other bear up under the vicissitudes of life. In the last case, Christians are told that each person, person must assume responsibility for his uh, particular, uh, the Greek word is idios, particular uh, duties, his own duties in, in life. Uh, no one has a right to shirk their responsibilities or to expect others to perform them. So there is no conflict between those two verses. <clears throat> In verse six, it says that him who is taught the words uh, share or communicate in King James Version and ASV, share in, in all things good, uh, all things, good things with him who teaches. Now, verse one is a duty to the erring brother. And verse two is a duty to others uh, with oppressive burdens. In verses three through five, the duties to himself. <clears throat> in this verse, it's the duty to those who teach the word of truth. That's the gospel. <clears throat> the student is to share his possessions with the one who has taught him. <clears throat> in First Corinthians, the fifth chapter, verse 18, the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox <clears throat> while it treads out the grain. and the laborer is worthy of his wages. And in 1 Corinthians verse 9, chapter 9, verses 9 through 14, and we it says essentially the same thing, but it, in particular in verse 11 it says, if we have sown spiritual things for you, is it a great thing if we reap your material things? But he says, of course, nevertheless, we haven't used this right. <clears throat> That's Paul speaking. This, in verse 14, it says, even so the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel <clears throat> should live from the gospel. <clears throat> so it's very scriptural and proper that those who <clears throat> have dedicated their lives preaching the gospel should also be uh, supported by the brethren who benefit from that preaching. <clears throat> in verse uh, chapter 6 verse 7 it says do not be deceived God is not mocked <clears throat> for whatever a man sows that he will also reap <clears throat> excuse me deceived the word deceived here is not the same as the word uh, in uh, chapter 
6 verse 3. Uh, here it is to wander or stray from the truth or to err to form a wrong judgment. Even so, men are not so clever in their wanderings that they can fool God. God is never fooled. We cannot sow one thing and expect to reap another. Uh, corn produces corn, wheat produces wheat, oats produces oats, whether domestic or wild, whatever they may be. That's the order of things that uh, God established. That's the way it is. Now, for it to be otherwise would uh, mock the very God-ordained system that uh, controls the physical and the spiritual world. <clears throat> In 1 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, verses 9 through 10, <clears throat> uh, which it just says in there, do not be deceived. <clears throat> You can read that for yourself. And in the 15th chapter, verse 33, it also says, do not be deceived. Evil company that corrupts good habits. In Galatians, the sixth chapter, verse eight, <clears throat> he says, for he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. <clears throat> it's the principle of sowing that Paul sets forth in uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 9, verse 6. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. The thing reaped is a direct result of the thing sown. So when one devotes himself to the material and fleshly side of his, of his life, he is certain to reap moral and spiritual corruption. To devote one's time, talent, and means as directed by the word of God, the gospel, that is sowing to the spirit. If we do these things, who will be able to separate us from the love of Christ? Romans 8, chapter verses 35 to 39. <clears throat> and the harvest will, of course, be eternal life. <clears throat> In Galatians, the sixth chapter, verse 9, it says, And not and let us not grow weary, that's tired, uh, discouraged, afraid, let's not lose heart, that sort of thing. Let us not grow weary while doing good, or well doing, as the King James and the SV says. For in due season, in time, <clears throat> at the appropriate time, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. <clears throat> do not grow weary. Uh, it's second kind of, of sowing. In English, the word good is used here and in verse 10 following. But the words in Greek are different in those two verses. Here it has the idea of uh, beautiful, noble, or morally good. And it is used uh, 89 times in the New Testament, such as in the uh, First Thessalonians 5:21, which you read, "Test all things, hold fast what it, what is good." In First Timothy, the fourth chapter, verses four through six, every creature of God is good. And uh, go down to six. It says, "You, if you do these things, be a good minister." and talking about the good doctrine. <clears throat> All of these goods are achieved by doing the will of God, which results in fewer difficulties and troubles. But it does require self-denial and discipline. This is a, a worthwhile alternative to sowing to the flesh in the verse eight. So we do not grow weary in their exercise of doing good. <clears throat> 
and God will not fail to give the harvest. They will come at a time of God's choosing in due time, in due season, which is the right and best time. So uh, don't become discouraged in the waiting. In verse 10, it says, therefore, such being the case, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the house of the faith. Opportunity here in uh, uh, due season, verse nine, are from the uh, same Greek word. So as this present life affords the Christian the one due season for sowing, so also does it afford the Christian the one opportunity of doing good. When the due season presents itself, uh, or the opportunity, if you will, do some sowing of good. In verse 11, it says, see with what large letters I have written to you with my own hand. Now, Paul may have employed a amanuensis here as he did in the letter to the Romans. In Romans the 16th chapter, verse 22, I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, reaching the Lord. So uh, there, for sure, Paul used uh, an amanuensis. If so, at uh, this point, he takes the pen to give the benediction, which uh, Paul calls the salutation. Salutation really is, you know, and we, we're writing a letter, we, the salutation is at the front, and the benediction is at the end. But <clears throat> uh, here, Paul is given the benediction, which has the form of the salutation. Paul did the same elsewhere in the Second Thessalonians 3.17. says that there is the salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is a sign in every epistle. So I write, it's really part of the benediction, but if Paul is using an amanuensis, this may in fact be his salutation. In uh, 1 Corinthians 16, chapter verse uh, 21, it's right before the one we previously read, the salutation with my own hand, Paul. So he may have taken the pen from Tertius to, to write that. So it could, in fact, be his real salutation. In Colossians 4.18, this salutation by my own hand. <clears throat> It'd be interesting. It's uh, just entirely speculation, of course. Nobody knows why, but why does he point out the large letters? <clears throat> is it the uh, thorn in the flesh that he talked about in 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, verse 7? So did he uh, write the entire epistle or just the benediction? Is there a problem with his eyesight or some other thing? Purely speculation, because we don't know what the, his thorn in the flesh was. <clears throat> In verse 12, as many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh. Now, this is the only place in the New Testament where this uh, phraseology is used. Um, these would compel or constrain, as used by the King James Version. These, those that are desiring to make a good showing in the flesh, these would compel you to be circumcised only that they may not suffer persecution for the cross, uh, the cross of Christ. If Paul wrote these closing remarks in large letters, and it may be that it just adds emphasis to what he's saying here. Here he uh, disparages the actions of his opponents and uh, questions their motives. The Judaizers were making a pretentious Species showing to compel the Gentiles to be circumcised, that is, uh, keeping the old law. By doing so, they could point to the Gentiles now keeping the law of Moses and thereby avoid persecution at the hand of other Jews. 
the essence of this, however, was to acknowledge the primacy of the old law. Now, such a conclusion was uh, unavoidable and one they may have missed, but it was one that Paul, he would not tolerate that for a moment. The old law was nailed to the cross, Colossians 2.14. Uh, it was, that uh, says there, having wiped out the handwriting requirements that was against us and contrary to us, taken out of the way, nailed it to the cross. But the cross was an approach to official Judaism. This was a stumbling block. In 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verse 18 through 25, it reads, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is, it is the power of God. And he goes on to say, I'll destroy the wisdom of the wise and so forth. And, but then verse 23, he says, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the uh, Greeks foolishness. So the cross, you know, the Jews could, could not conceive of their savior, which they uh, were looking for. They could not conceive him as one who would actually go to the cross. They didn't understand that, didn't accept it. <clears throat> so no doubt the uh, Jew could see that the preaching of the cross and the salvation that it provided separate and apart from the law of Moses. They could see that that did away with the old system of rites and observances. And then they all could see that it uh, did away with their national identity. Well, there's no, no reason for a Jewish nation at that point in time. So the entire message of the Judaizers was in essence a effort of self-preservation. In verse uh, 13, it says, for not even those who are circumcised keep the law, but they desire or compel, it was using verse 12. They desire to have you circumcised that they may boast or glory or rejoice, the same as used in verse 14. They may boast in your flesh. <clears throat> now, this may refer to either Jewish Christians or the Gentile Christians who were circumcised. It doesn't matter which. He, Neither could keep the law perfectly, so the old law condemned. It could not offer salvation. The old law, therefore, was never intended to be anything but divisional. The desire then to have the Gentiles circumcised and keep the law had to be out of a motive other than salvation. The motive in verse 12 seemed to be avoidance of persecution. Here, it seemed to be pride in their successful efforts to make Jewish uh, proselytes. As Paul sees it, the credibility of the Judaizers and the credulity of the Gentiles are both suspect. <clears throat> and uh, when he says, talks about boast, uh, you look at uh, Ephesians 2nd chapter, verse 8 and 9, it talks about that they have been saved by grace. Not of yourselves. This is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. No reason to boast. In verse 14, but God forbid, and the literal translation of that is, let it not be. God forbid that I should boast, the glory rejoice, same as in verse 13 above, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. The Judaizers were boasting in the flesh of men. Paul was exulting in the cross by which he uh, has crucified the flesh, the fleshly world. The cross stood for the atoning death of Jesus Christ, and Paul owed his redemption to it, Galatians 2.20. In uh, verse 15, it says, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. And you can look at uh, Galatians 5th chapter, verse 6 also. <clears throat> also in verse uh, 1 Corinthians 
verse 719, circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing, but keeping, keeping the commandments of God is what matters. Both are the same. That is, they both are nothings. Being nothings, they cease to exist. Since they do not exist as distinctions, they may not be used as a claim on salvation. The external marks on a man's body carry no spiritual import. True circumcision, therefore, is of the heart. And uh, Romans, the second chapter, verse 28, when 9 talks about one who is not a Jew, is not a Jew outwardly, or a circumcision outwardly of flesh, but one who's born inwardly. So Jesus has created himself one new man, a new creation, as uh, Paul stated in Ephesians 2.15. It says there he's created himself one new man with no, of the two, Jew and Gentile. In Galatians, the 16th, uh, 6th chapter, verse 16, and as many as walk according to his rule, stated, uh, just stated in 15, peace and mercy be upon him. Uh, peace be upon him and mercy, King James and ASV, and, and upon the Israel of God. And that's the Jew and Gentile as one, the spiritual Israel that he's talking about here, the church. So being a Jew or Gentile is neither a privilege nor is it a barrier. One may glory only in the cross of Christ. And if you're Christ and you're Abraham's seed, in Galatians 3.29, and he says in verse 17, from now on, let no one trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. And there's no doubt that Paul had been greatly distressed by these uh, Judaizer, Judaizing teachers who had called into question his apostleship and the gospel he preached. The physical marks he bore in his body testified to his faithfulness to the Lord Jesus and his gospel. Paul had laid his arguments before the Galatians to be accepted or rejected. So he did not want to be troubled by them anymore. And his benediction, verse 18, brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirits. Amen. So that concludes Galatians. And I appreciate your kind attention.